It all started with two sharks swimming deep in the ocean looking for food. They were both captured on a deep sea monitoring camera. But suddenly, the nature video turned into a horror movie. One of the sharks started squirming in panic, raising a cloud of sand, but a few seconds later it became motionless. The shark was attacked by a huge creature clinging to its head and simply suffocating the predator. The huge creature that looked like a giant alien louse was so fearless and cruel it wasn't afraid to fight the shark. This creature was a giant isopod. It strangled the shark to slowly devour it later. Giant isopods are a great example of how the ocean can give birth to monsters at great depths. They can be found 500 to 7,000 feet below the surface. That is far beyond the reach of amateur divers. Sometimes giant isopods are caught by fishermen and sometimes they get captured on deep sea cameras, but they're actually poorly studied. It's believed giant isopods are just harmless, leisurely scavengers who feed on what falls on them from above. That is everything that other inhabitants of the ocean haven't eaten. So they're sort of underwater vacuum cleaners. I mean, giant isopods don't usually attack sharks, but just because they don't usually attack doesn't mean that isopods can't attack them. Moreover, we have a video that proves it. With this in mind, you can't claim that giant isopods don't hunt other large sea creatures. Maybe people just haven't been lucky to see it yet. Or actually feel it. Moreover, giant isopods have the adaptations required for a ruthless attack. Their four sets of jaws are designed to cut and tear prey. Four of them. And yes, giant isopods may not see very well, which again is just a theory. But evolution gave them two sets of antenna for navigation in space. Seeing how a giant isopod was able to attack the shark and strangle it, poor eyesight doesn't bother it at all. However, compared to their relatives, giant isopods aren't actually that bad. Simothoidae are much more compact creatures, but they are ectoparasites, and almost all fish hate them. These small isopods simply attach to the fish skin and suck their blood, secreting substances to keep it from clotting. Moreover, parasitism is not some kind of temporary strategy of their life, say at the early stages. Simothoidae live like that all the time, periodically changing hosts and selecting the most suitable and delicious ones. But actually having a parasite while living underwater is not uncommon. I tend to think that every creature in the ocean has some kind of company. There are different studies on this topic, but on average a third or even half of all fish have various parasites. Sometimes there can be several dozens of them on one fish, and that seems to be normal. I wouldn't be surprised if fish without parasites are actually considered losers among their kin or something like that. Because sometimes even parasites have parasites of their own. For example, the parasitic copepod managed to get eight leeches at once. Perhaps the leeches also had smaller parasites, but they were too tiny to see. And yet if you think about it, it becomes clear that giant isopods aren't the thing sharks should be afraid of. In the spring of 2017, San Francisco Bay witnessed the strandings of leopard sharks. By April, the sharks washed up on beaches and began to die by the dozens. And although most sharks probably died without being seen, scientists have estimated the toll at more than 1,000 animals. And that's just one species. Keep in mind there were also dozens of smooth hound sharks and hundreds of other fish, but what happened to them? When the scientists cut the sharks open, they found that something entered the sharks' noses, made their way into the brain, and ate it away like acid. As a result, the sharks simply got disoriented and eventually stranded. Or they simply died in the water and then sank to the bottom. Turned out the reason for that was the protozoan, a single-cell organism. Miamiensis avidus usually infects farmed fish and the mass die-off in San Francisco Bay was the first case of shark infection, though probably not the last one. The strangest thing is that all previous victims of the protozoan were bony fish. That is, they were very different in terms of evolution. But it looks like Miami Ensis avidus found a way to target sharks too. But sharks have other problems too. Have you ever been bothered by something that got in your eye and didn't let it blink? Greenland and Pacific sleeper sharks know this feeling, only it comes not from eyelashes or dust, but from Omata coita elongata. These are parasitic copepods about 1.2 inches long that attach themselves to the cornea of a shark's eye. Naturally, the shark can feel that, and this causes serious vision problems. Fortunately, predators don't rely on their eyes during the hunt, so the parasite is relatively harmless. 
But why do they attach to the cornea? There's no exact answer, but there are two theories. Copepods find it difficult to attach to shark skin due to its structure, or damage to the cornea is less likely to trigger an immune response. Overall, the parasites just feel more comfortable that way. And since I mentioned shark skin, let me go into more detail on that. If you look closely, it becomes clear that the skin is covered with something like microscopic denticles. It's believed they protect against parasites and also reduce drag while swimming. In short, they turn the surface of the shark into sandpaper. And other fish take advantage of this. They rub against sharks. I mean, literally. When researchers noticed this, they were shocked because sharks can eat the creatures that use them as a scratching post. However, this doesn't stop the smaller fish, and they continue to get rid of the old scales, rubbing themselves against the sharks. The sharks aren't happy with this and try to dodge, but it doesn't always work out. Well, how can you dodge a hundred small fish swimming behind you? Good thing that in the wild they don't have a concept of reputation. Otherwise, some sharks would no longer seem so scary. However, there are always creatures that don't care about sharks' reputation of ruthless killers, like leopard seals in New Zealand. No, they don't use sharks for scrubbing, they just hunt them. There's a very small number of predators that can do this. Scientists used to assume that leopard seals simply eat the remains of already dead sharks without putting themselves at risk. But a study published in late 2021 found that leopard seals often have characteristic wounds on their bodies that only sharks can inflict. Well, there are also shark remains in their feces. Scientists don't quite understand why leopard seals would hunt sharks at all, given that it's a hell of a dangerous thing to do. Apparently, there's something very nutritious and tasty about sharks. And this something makes leopard seals take risks. Another animal that doesn't care about sharks being some kind of apex predators is the giant moray eel. It's the largest eel species in the ocean, so it can feed on small sharks. 10 feet long and weighing up to 66 pounds, giant moray eels hunt from ambush attacking almost any prey as it swims past their lair. And when you're attacked by such a large creature, it's pretty hard to do something about it. But it's not just size that matters. Moray eels have two sets of jaws, external and internal ones. The latter extend to grab food and drag it down the esophagus while the former don't let the prey escape. And yes, they actually look like the jaws of a xenomorph. Naturally, sharks don't look like animals that can become someone's prey, and the sharks are aware of this. For example, they won't mind to dine on an octopus. It's not easy to catch it, but some species do an excellent job. However, not everyone is lucky. At some point, employees of the Seattle Aquarium began to find dogfish sharks dead at the bottom. Their bodies were mutilated, but people couldn't understand what had happened until they set up a camera and watched a giant octopus who lived together with sharks killing every shark that came close every single one of them methodically as if he had a plan the octopus wrestled the sharks often flipping them upside down so they couldn't move and then biting off chunks and eating them for a while when he got enough of the prey he dumped it and looked for a new victim i have to say that when the aquarium workers moved the octopus to the shark tank they were worried and hoped that his size and ability to disguise would protect him. Turns out it's the sharks they had to worry for. And yet an octopus, a giant moray eel, or a leopard seal are familiar opponents. Sharks can predict where danger will come from. It's quite different when the water itself becomes the killer, or rather microscopic algae that live in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. When algae reproduce more actively than usual, that is, when the weather's too warm, this results in a red tide that kills all marine life in its path. The algae produce a strong toxin that targets the central nervous system of animals. Over 600 tons of marine creatures of various species fell victim to the red tide in 2021. Just think about it. So many animals died that they had to be counted by weight. Fleeing from imminent death, many fish, including sharks, head inland along rivers. And although red tide happens every year, the situation is getting worse every year due to global warming. But here's what surprised me. Turns out sharks aren't big fans of humans either. Not because we hunt them or anything like that. Sharks just don't like dive cages. To understand why, you need to look at the teeth of a great white shark. Yes, there are many of them. 
They're frightening and sharp, but they are totally unreliable. Even a slight injury can knock them out. Evolution did this on purpose so that damaged teeth would fall off and quickly get replaced with new healthy ones. Because, well, what's a shark without its teeth? A herring that's too aggressive? Shark teeth are indeed fixed very loosely. Sometimes sharks lose them when biting big prey, especially if they accidentally touch the bone, and this is not uncommon if you're a great white shark. Now, imagine the shark bites not just bone, but a dive cage made from metal. Yes, you can say goodbye to half the jaw. In 2016, a video of a shark caught in a dive cage went viral. Everyone was worried there were people in the cage at the moment. Luckily, it was empty, so only the shark itself was hurt. Sometime later, the shark from this video was accidentally found by comparing the scars with the wounds that the predator got during the collision with the cage, and, well, it turned into a C version of Toothless. Just look at that smile. Well, don't they look the same? Yeah. Metal rods knocked at least half the shark's teeth out. But don't worry, as I said, Evolution designed shark teeth so that they can be easily replaced with new ones. They're rooted not in bone, but in soft cartilage. A great white shark can go through over 20,000 teeth in its lifetime. 20,000! By the way, these predators live up to 70 years or more. That's about one lost tooth a day. So the great white shark, which was named Gums, soon grew all its teeth back. Although that toothless smile is the most charming one I've ever seen. See you later.